So, assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, I'll talk about macular neovascularization related to inherited retinal diseases. This is the outline of my talk. I'll talk about background and pathogenesis of macular neovascularization in inherited retinal diseases. Then I will discuss the main IRDs that can be associated with macular neovascularization. And at the end, we'll discuss the treatment of IRD-related macular neovascularization. So macular neovascularization can be a presenting feature or a late complication in inherited retinal diseases. It leads to acute visual loss in patients with pre-existing visual dysfunction. And most macular neovascularization lesions form a fibrotic scar with variable visual outcomes. So the pathogenesis of macular neovascularization in IRDs is likely to be influenced by the causative genetic variant. However, damage to photoreceptors, RPE, proximal brain, and choriocapillaries could promote secondary macular neovascularization development. In addition, chronic inflammation has also been postulated as a mechanism for MNV in IRDs. So this is the main part of my talk today. IRDs that can be associated with or complicated by macular neovascularization. So let's start with the Stargardt disease or ABCA4 related retinopathy. Onset usually occurs in childhood or early adolescence, visions between 2070 and 2200. Clinically, they have bullseye pattern or beaten prone's appearance with or without yellowish flakes. And fluorescent angiography may show dark choroid. Very popular sparing, which is clearly evident on fundus autofluorescence in the picture, is one of the characteristic findings. So macular atrophy is the main cause of visual loss in Stargardt disease. MNV can also lead to significant visual impairment. And macular neovascularization in late onset disease may be easily misdiagnosed as age-related macular degeneration because flicks can resemble drusen. Patients should be instructed to avoid bright light and vitamin A intake. Another IRD is pattern dystrophy, or BRBH2-related retinopathy, or peripherinopathies. It includes butterfly, shaved dystrophy, reticular dystrophy, and multifocal dystrophy simulating Stargardt disease. It also includes adult onset for view macular vitelliform dystrophy. So visual loss is the result of either geographic atrophy or macular neovascularization. In one case series, MNV was reported in 50% of patients, However, in other reports, MNV occurred in 5 to 18% of cases. Another dystrophy that can be associated with uh, macular neovascularization is North Carolina macular dystrophy caused by mutation in MCDR1 gene. Most patients retain good vision despite advanced macular phenotype. The macular lesions are congenital and bilaterally symmetrical. Clinically, they have excavated macular lesions that appear like a coloboma or a toxoscar with a thick white fibrotic rim, as you see in, this, in the photos. MNV has been reported in a few cases. Another IRD is bistrophinopathies, or BIST1-related retinopathy. It includes BIST disease and autosomal recessive bistrophinopathy, or ARB. They usually have hypropia and abnormal EOG. Macular neovascularization can be observed in early stages of the disease. It's not confi confined to stage 6 disease. It has high prevalence of up to 35% based on OCTA diagnosis. So autosomal recessive bistrophinopathy patients are at increased risk of acute angle closure glaucoma. They have multifocal vitelliform lesions that are more extensive and extending beyond arcades compared to the autosomal dominant BIS disease. Another IRD that is more common in Saudi Arabia compared to the rest of the world is Enhanced Iscone Syndrome. It's an autosomal recessive retinal dystrophy caused by mutations in R2E3, characterized by hyperfunction of short wavelength cones, S or blue cones. Patients usually have early onset nyctalopia and hyperopia, and accommodative esotropia can be a presenting sign in children. They have vatognomonic ERG, and clinically, the fundus shows deep nominal pigmentary lesions along the vascular arcades at the level of the RPE. Yellow-white dots, usually infronasal to the disc and inferior to the optic nerve head. Macular and or peripheral schesis, 
torbido-like lesions and different patterns of subretinal fibrosis. So in young patients with macular neovascularization and night blindness, enhanced Escon syndrome should be considered. It was observed in patients as young as two years, and it occurs in 15% of our enhanced Escon syndrome patients. It can present unilaterally or bilaterally, generally in symmetric locations. In the active stage of the macular neovascularization, you can see retinal venous congestion. It then evolves into a localized unifocal fibrotic nodule with a pigmented spot on the surface and building retinal vessels into the lesions. Three of our patients were treated with intravitreal bevacizumab injections. All developed fibrotic lesions at the macula with stable vision. This is an 80-year-old male with bilateral consecutive macular neovascularization. He initially presented with decrease of vision in the left eye. The left fundus shows subfoveal neovascularization with subretinal hemorrhage and leakage on fluorescein angiography. So patient then underwent burst glenal vitrectomy and TBA injection, and the lesion involuted into a fibrotic nodule. So three years later, patient presented with a new macular neovascularization in the fellow eye, as you can see in the right eye, in the right fundus. So another patient is a two-year-old girl with bilateral consecutive macular neovascularization. She initially presented with decrease of vision in the left eye. The left fundus shows new vascular membrane with subretinal exudates and hemorrhages. Interestingly, the right fundus showed a fibrotic nodule in a symmetric location at the macular border. So the patient, after one year, this is her left fundus photo, showed a fibrotic nodule without any treatment. This is a 10-year-old male with macular neovascularization who's following up for enhanced Escon syndrome. At one visit, he developed a macular neovascularization. He received intravitreal bevacizumab, and then the lesion involuted into a fibrotic scar, and this is six months following intravitreal bevacizumab injection. This is the right one, this photo. Another entity is source paper on this dystrophy. It presents in the fourth to fifth decade. It's a dominantly inherited disease. Patients usually present with complaints of problem transitioning between light and dark, followed by central vision abnormalities. Fundus will show fine yellow drusen-like deposits under the RVE, which can progress to bilateral macular atrophy, as you can see in the photos. Visual impairment is usually from macular neovascularization or macular atrophy. Macular neovascularization occurs in around 60% of SARS B fundus dystrophy and must have bilateral sequential lesions. Altered TEM3 function facilitates the release of tumor necrosis factor alpha, resulting in pro inflammatory and pro angiogenic effects. Therefore, subcutaneous adalimumab, an inhibitor of TNF alpha, has been recently used as a molecularly targeted approach. Another dystrophy that can be associated with macular neovascularization is Doyne Honeycomb retinal dystrophy, also called Malatia levantinis or autosomal dominant drusen. It is a dominantly inherited dystrophy caused by mutation in the EFMB1 gene. The drusen are present in childhood, but patients are asymptomatic until their 40s or 50s to usually progress to severe impairment from geographic atrophy or macular neovascularization. So drusen can be seen in the macula around the edge of the optic nerve or nasal to the optic disc in a radiating pattern. Drusen can increase in size and number with age. And you can see in the fundus photos, hyperautofluorescent drusen at the disc margin and prepapillary, which is a characteristic finding. Another IRD is late onset retinal degeneration. Patients usually present with nyctalopia in the fifth or sixth decade. Mutation in the C1QTNF5 gene, which is expressed in the RPE lens and ciliary epithelium. Central vision is affected by the seventh decade from advanced choreoretinal atrophy, and the fundus will show yellow white subretinal deposits in the peripheral and peripheral region. Patient may have long anterior zonules with peripupillary iris transillumination defects. And macular neovascularization has been shown to involve both the macular and peripheral retina. So another IRD is choroiduremia. It's an X-link. 
Hereditary chorioretinal dystrophy. Patients have nyctalopia usually in the first or second decade of life. They can have a gradual peripheral visual loss occurs over the next three to five decades. And macular neovascularization is rare, rarely reported in chorioderemia and can occur in affected males and in female carriers. Another dystrophy is gyrate dystrophy, which is autosomal recessive disease. Nyctalopia starts early in the first decade of life, caused by mutation in the OAT gene. They have deficiency of the enzyme ornithine delta amine transferase, or OAT, results in a tenfold rise in plasma ornithine, which is toxic to RBA in coral. So they usually have myopia and subcapsular cataract. Macular new vascularization has been reported in a few cases with good response to anti-VEGF injections. Treatment also includes a low proteinine, arginine restricted dye, and vitamin B6 supplements. Another dystrophy is Bayetti crystalline dystrophy, caused by allelic, a mutation in CIV4V2. Patients usually have nyctalopia and paracentral scotoma around the third decade of life. Clinically, they have multiple small refractile crystalline deposits throughout the fundus in both the outer and the inner retina and choroid, which tend to disappear with time, leading to atrophic holes, so atrophic lesions. These deposits also can be seen in the cornea and lens capsule. It can be associated with peripapillary neovascularization and macular neovascularization. Another RD is retinitis pigmentosa. The classic features of RB include attenuated retinal blood vessels, inter-retinal pigmentation, valor of the optic disc, and hyperautofluorescent rings on fundus autofluorescence. Around 10 cases of antigenotype RB have been reported to develop macular neovascularization. Macular neovascularization has also been seen in other systemic disease or syndrome that affect the retina, like pseudosandoma elasticum, which is an autosomal recessive multi-system disorder that involves the skin GI tract and the eye caused by biallelic mutation in ABCC6 gene. Fundus will show angioid streaks, speckled appearance temporal to the macula, but orange and drusen of the optic nerve. Angioid streaks are breaks in a classified black prox membrane and predispose to the formation of macular neovascularization in up to 86% of patients. Another disease is Oliver McFarlane syndrome. It's an extremely rare condition associated with chorioretinal degeneration, growth hormone def deficiency, hair abnormalities, and cerebellar dysfunction. Only one case was complicated by macular neovascularization in a 10-year-old female who was treated with two anti-VEGF injections and continued to be stable. Iatrogenic macular neovascularization as you know, traumatic macular neovascularization has been reported with vitreoretinal surgery. In one report, iatrogenic macular neovascularization developed one month post luxerna treatment in one RB case. Postoperatively, the OCT showed a break in proximal brain. And luckily, the macular neovascularization regressed spontaneously without treatment. So now we'll talk about treatment for IRD related macular neovascularization. Treatment options include intravitreal anti-VEGF injections, intravitreal triamcinolone injections, argon laser photocoagulation, photodynamic therapy, and combined treatment for any of the above. So intravitreal anti-VEGF injections are the mainstay of treatment. While there are reports of a spontaneous regression in the literature, the majority of cases showed fluid resolution in response to anti-VEGF treatment with v stable or improved VA. So most IRD-related macular neovascularization need a short course of anti-VEGF compared to age-related macular degeneration. And caution needs to be taken interpreting the OCT scan, since many IRDs are associated with CME, macular schesis, subretinal fluid, and subretinal hyporeflective spaces, which might confound exudative changes related to macular neovascularization. So in conclusion, the possibility of macular neovascularization development should be considered when IRD patients present with acute visual loss. There is no consensus on the management of IRD-related macular neovascularization, and the degree of severity of the underlying IRD also affects the visual prognosis. Therefore, patient counseling is very important. Thank you.
سو ثانك يو دكتور ابرار جريت كومبرهنسيف ريفيو سو I'll open the floor for uh, questions, but I have first a question. Did you look at our patients with uh, macular neovascularization and uh, how many injections did they need to uh, achieve regression? Actually, we have uh, from our enhanced skull syndrome patients, the, the series of our patients, mm -hmm. uh, we had three patients who received injections, uh, trivascular bevacizumab injections, and they did, ended up with a fibrotic nodule. Also, we have patients with Don honeycomb or autosomal dominant drusen. Also, uh, they receive intravitreal injections. They usually need more injections compared to enhanced skull syndrome patients. Uh, these are the patients that I saw myself. But other uh, entities, I didn't see cases. So it's very rare in the literature. Only a few cases or small case series. So overall, they need uh, one to two injections. For enhanced to... skull syndrome patients, they yeah. usually one, two, Maximum, sometimes three, they don't need uh, too many injections. injections. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Abra. I just want to add something because, you know, I've been involved in the enhanced uh, Escon syndrome project for a long time. Um, in the past, we didn't have any intravitreal injections. And uh, when we saw patients with fibrosis, we didn't know what they had initially. And then we, re we learned that this is actually enhanced Ascon syndrome complicated by fibrosis. And uh, the, uh, when we saw the fibrotic lesions, uh, we didn't know if this originally was a an, an macular neovascularization or just fibrosis, you know, because some people were very, very young, you know, they're like two years old and three years old, and they had these fibrotic lesions. But then, some of them came with blood and were treated later on with uh, anti-VEGF uh, therapy. And uh, the end result is the same. So whether you treat or you don't treat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same behavior happens in, in treated and untreated eyes. Maybe the fibrosis will get smaller if you treat earlier, but they look the same whether they were treated or not. Once they involute after treatment, they look exactly the same as those who were not treated at all. So I don't know how much the uh, treatment actually affects the final outcome. They make the lesions look a little smaller, but at the end, that's it. You know, they, they just involute and look the same. Okay. So can you explain to us why the terminology of macular neovascularization is used, not choroidal neovascularization? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, all three types of uh, choroidal neovascularization were reported in uh, inherited retinal diseases, type 1, type 2, type 3. So it's better to call it macular neovascularization rather than choroidal neovascularization because some of them, they have retinal uh, rub lesion, type 3 uh, uh, neovascularization. So it's a better broad term because uh, even in the same disease, you will see some people say type 2 and some will say type 3 neovascularization. So to make it a broad term, Better, uh, better description. So if no further questions, uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, attending the Grand Rounds today. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you all. <laughs>